um, ICT management uh, committees, University of Strategic Planning, University Management Tenders Committee, um, University Procurement Planning Committee, University Library Development Committee, and the University Open and Distance Learning Committee. He also served as the project manager for World Bank Assisted Science and Technology Post Basic Step B project at the university. And he was also a member of the University Governing Council of the university. At state level, Ahmed Shafei chaired the committee for the development of ICT blueprints for the state. And he's a member of the Sokoto State University Planning Committee. Um, he's a member of the Sokoto State Implementation Committee and chairman of the committee for the establishment of computer technology institutes. He's also a member technical committee on the state of emergency on education in Sokoto State. And he chairs another committee for the review of personnel and payroll databases of the states. Um, at the national level, Ahmed Shafei uh, was a member of the Nigerian Research and Education Network, NGREN, um, as planning as well as implementation committee. So uh, Shafei, I sort of hand over to you. Thank you very much, Owen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of day one of the EcoConnect User Conference 2022. Uh, the topic or the uh, subject is trust and identity growing the EduID Nigeria Federation. And under this, we have three topics that will be discussing on the Nigerian Identity Federation, the ensuring a strong identity federation for EduGain, and then joining EduGain opportunities for Nigerian research and education. I'm happy to announce that we have very competent speakers that will do justice to these uh, topics. Each of the speakers will be given uh, 30 minutes to do their presentation. And uh, we'll leave the question and answers until every presenter has uh, finished. Like Owen has said, whatever questions one has, we can put it in the Q&A. Uh, then we can now treat them uh, at the end. So having said this, uh, I think we can uh, start the presentations. And the first presentation will be on the Nigerian Identity Federation which will be presented by no other person than Mr. Owen Oyoa, the CEO of Echo Connect. Uh, like I said, the topic is the Nigerian Identity Federation. And uh, Mr. Oyoa uh, is the CEO of the Echo Connect Research and Education Network Initiative, where he has worked since its inception in 2009. He oversees infrastructure development, capacity building and advocacy with the goal of developing all aspects of the research and education network and its community in Nigeria. Uh, Owen has over 25 years of ICT experience. He has worked in the UK, US and Nigeria with companies including Server Enterprise UK Limited, OpenLink Software Incorporated, and Data Sphere Solutions Limited providing pre-sales support and consultancy for major corporate organizations on solutions that include middleware, SAP, business intelligence, data warehousing, and mail and collaboration. He's a strong supporter of open source software, open science, open access, and other open paradigms necessary to support the growth and impact of technology and scholarly output in Nigeria. Owen holds a joint honors degree in chemistry and biochemistry from the University of Salford, United Kingdom. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Uh, Owa, who will uh, be discussing on the Nigerian Identity Federation. So over to you, Mr. Yoha. 
Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Shafi, for the introduction. Um, I'll share my screen and uh, essentially what I want to do here, because I'm, I'm quite conscious that as uh, attendees come in, we go to have different kinds of, um, of uh, participants. And um, I do think that some aspects of the presentation from the, uh, the speakers uh, is going to be a little bit technical. So what, what I want to uh, try to outline in my presentation is sort of give the basics of the Nigerian Identity Federation um, and uh, why that is very important to, to you as a person within the uh, research and education network or academic um, community, why this is really very important and why uh, recent uh, developments where um, the Nigerian Identity Federation has now been accepted into EDUGAIN, why that is really uh, very important and what opportunities open up for, for the community as a result of these uh, developments. Um, the speakers that we have here today will be able to do much better uh, 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 job of talking about the infrastructure and the benefits. But I think if you all really pay close attention, you can find that this would be uh, beneficial to you and your, your institutions. And of course, from our perspective, we want more and more people joining the Nigerian Identity Federation because it is going to give you access to services, collaboration opportunities, and other frameworks that uh, you probably were not available to you before. And we'll get some examples from our other speakers. So I would uh, just talk about, you know, what is an identity? What is an identity federation? Well, it's basically an association of organizations. In our, in our scenario, it'd be an association of institutions that come together to exchange information about users and resources and enable collaborations and transactions. So um, that's basically the, you know, Nigeria is a federation of states. So I think the concept of a federation is, uh, is known to us. We have different states that make up the Nigerian federation on the, the, the federation of the country that's called Nigeria. So in uh, these education terms as well, we have frameworks that allow institutions to come together as an identity federation where everybody sort of trusts each other and because of that trust, able to exchange information um, and resources. So um, the Nigerian Federation or the Nigerian Identity Federation is referred to as eduid.ng and uh, it's been, uh, it's a federation for all higher education institutions. It's been operated by uh, Echo Connect on behalf of the research and education community in the country. And uh, it provides opportunities for feder federated access to uh, cloud-based um, and trusted management environments. In the morning session, we actually talked a lot about uh, repositories and uh, the fact that we're trying to create a series of national repositories for different um, functions. But it's very important that these national repositories, if they're to be properly utilized and sustainable, that we have the appropriate uh, trust and identity frameworks around them that allow only trusted and secure authorized access to data and metadata in the repositories. And we know that only people who we, we want to populate and access these databases have access to them. Um, so in order to be able to do that in a, in a cohesive way, then there's the need for these uh, trust and identity frameworks and way of uh, identity federations. So um, again, the key 
key pillars around uh, trust and identity, uh, identity is to make sure that we implement privacy for users, security for users, um, and good governance. And all of those would really combine to give us trust when we're accessing services and resources. Right. So um, this picture tries to kind of depict uh, what we're kind of talking about. So you've got your different users here who are basically members of uh, a, an institution, a university, a polytechnic, and they want to access different resources that are available from in the cloud. Um, and there's some examples, it could be an e-learning platform, it could be a library management system or some collaboration tool, or you, you basically want to use services like um, EduRoam to be able to, to roam on different uh, Wi-Fi roaming on, on different campuses, or you want to get access to databases um, and publications that are only allowed you only have allowed access to these um, publications with federated access. And of course, there are other tools and applications that you want to be able to, to access. Now, service providers are making these uh, tools and services and databases available, but only in a manner that they know you're coming from a trusted source. And so the role that the EduID or the Identity Federation plays here is almost like a digital passport that gives you access to some of these um, services. So as the bullet points are, are saying on the left hand side, you know, seamless access to information tools and services. And at the same time, uh, you can solve complex issues like how to very verification of users, um, the permissions that users have when they do have access to certain, certain systems or services and uh, credential management and privacy are catered for within a identity federation. And I think some of the other speakers will, will speak to that. Um, so in the case of uh, uh, Echo Connect, what we're trying to do is build uh, some services in the cloud. Some are available, some are uh, in final stages of development, but uh, through the open science cloud that we're currently developing, we want uh, users to be able to access some of the services uh, that we have available using um, identity infrastructure to, to access some of these things. Um, and there'll be more services being developed and uh, there'll be access to other services and applications beyond uh, the Open Science Cloud. So um, identity management is important for, for users from a student's perspective. Um, they can keep you know fewer accounts to keep track of during their studies um, they can use single sign-on to access different resources and content in and outside nigeria so you don't have the situation where you have students trying to remember usernames and passwords to access different services um, the identity federation your that just gives you single uh, credentials that you can use to access multiple uh, services. And of course, because of uh, inter-federation, there are more collaboration opportunities and potentially um, access to more resources and information globally. Um, from an institution's perspective, um, they can basically manage um, uh, campus logins more efficiently, reduce the overhead in terms of uh, students and staff have lost or can't remember their uh, using the, their passwords, etc. And then they have to be reissued with uh, new passwords. That kind of uh, admin overhead is greatly reduced. And um, 
you basically have secure access to multiple services from a single point without having to maintain multiple systems. So it does really solve a lot of user management issues on the campus for services that are being provided specifically for uh, students in one university or for wider REN based uh, services. Now, the, um, the Nigerian Identity Federation does have uh, some uh, governance that, uh, and in that governance, we basically have a steering committee. Um, so the steering committee is made up of the federation operators and the technical committee. So uh, Echo Connect serves as the operator of the federation, but then there's a, a group of technical people uh, from a number of universities in the country who serve on the technical committee. And uh, as it happens, the moderator for this, se this session, Ahmed Shafi, is actually the chair of the, the technical committee. So he's from Usmanu Danfodio University, but we have other representatives on that technical committee from University of Lagos, um, Covenant University, University of Abuja and Unamdi Azikwe University. So together um, we form the um, steering committee to provide governance and guide the direction in which the uh, federation uh, needs to go. And then we also have the assembly of members. So once your institution is uh, signed up to the identity federation, then uh, uh, effectively all the users uh, within that entity or institution become part of the uh, assembly of uh, members. Uh, the idea being that if they want to see some new improvements or features or functionality that they feel they, they need, they can make those requests through to the um, technical committee and uh, we look at how those things get implemented. Um, eligibility in terms of being able to join the uh, Identity Federation. Um, as long as your institution is accredited with the Nigerian Universities Commission, the uh, MBTE or the NCCE, or you are a Nigerian research institution, then you are eligible to, to, to become a member of the Identity Federation. Um, organizations external to, to the research community who are not uh, accredited by the above mentioned organizations uh, can still join as affiliate members or service providers um, subject to review and approval by the um, steering committee. Um, I will be, we will be sharing all the presentations. So uh, there's a kind of the workflow of how joining the federation works. Um, essentially, you uh, basically go to the EduID website. I think there are links in the presentation. Um, and then you fill in the forms um, and you send them through to, to the federation operator. And then the, the workflow just uh, shows how um, the application process is um, is done, the steering committee basically approves and checks that you have all the uh, eligibility, pass the eligibility rules, credentials. Um, if you're going to be potentially a service provider, we'll try to look at what benefit that service would, would be offering to the community. But once um, uh, the approval is given, then um, an identity provider account is basically set up on the, on the infrastructure and then institutions can start to use their identity uh, provider and populate their IDP with their users. And then from then on, users have the opportunity to join the federation and start to gain access to um, services that are available um, as a member. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail later. Um, it's currently free to join the Federation, um, although um, we are still sort of looking at models where we can 
sort of uh, because sustaining the infrastructure does cost cost some money. Um, we're sort of going to be looking at what kind of models we can look at for sustainability uh, in a manner that uh, it doesn't cost too much to be a member of the federation, um, um, but also will be, allow us to be able to run the infrastructure and provide the support and maintenance required to, to keep the federation viable and uh, growing. Um, into federation, so we've talked about, uh, obviously my presentation is just about the basics of the Nigerian Identity Federation, but the great thing about uh, federations is the ability to interfederate with uh, other federations. And uh, so if there's a service that may be available or a database that is available within the UK Federation, but you're a member of the Nigerian Federation, how, um, how is possible or feasible would it be to access that database or that service that the UK Federation is uh, offering? Well, that, that's basically all done through the concepts of uh, inter-federation where all the, all the different identity federations across, across the globe inter-federates and uh, Edugain, Edugain is kind of the global aggregator of all uh, the uh, different uh, national identity federations. So once you become a member of Edugain, you potentially have access to all the uh, global federations, or at least the federations that are members of Edugain. And what that potentially means is um, access to different kinds of tools, infrastructure, databases. Some may be free, some may have some licensing fees applied to them. But what it does, it opens up a whole plethora of opportunity for students, researchers, academics to access content uh, beyond the shores and access things that hitherto you might not have even realized you might need as a student or as a researcher. And uh, Earlier this month, uh, the Nigerian Identity Federation um, was accepted uh, into uh, Edugain. Uh, I think um, Mario will be talking a bit more about that. Um, I just also want to just mention that um, with the uh, Nigerian Identity Federation, the work we've done there um, to make it uh, robust, there's been a lot of work we've actually had a lot of help and assistance as well from uh, what WACREN have been doing in the region. Um, but we're also um, working on BONEF ID uh, to sort of give more functionality and robustness to the Identity Federation. Um, and BONEF ID is some underlying infrastructure that will help, um, help institutions to use our federation where single points of uh, access and login have not been really identified. Um, I don't want to go into a bona fide presentation now, but uh, the link on this slide will actually take you to the presentation that uh, was made at the Ubuntu Net, uh, Ubuntu Net Alliance conference uh, a couple of months ago. So we're actually using bona fide to buttress the Nigerian Identity Federation and strengthen students' identity as well. Um, so what would be the, the, the next steps? Well, one of the things I would want to see happen is having more institutions joining the Nigerian Identity Federation, just because there is so much the, uh, potentially that is uh, on offer to institutions. Uh, in terms of services. So um, for those of you who are with us at the moment, um, potentially you can read uh, the policy document that describes the um, Federation, what it's all about. And uh, you can actually uh, sign up to the Federation. The second link shows you the exact steps you need to take 
to sign up to the Federation, either as an identity provider. So that's an identity provider is typically a consumer of uh, services or as a service provider. So if you do have a service that you want to offer to, to the uh, research and education community, you can also apply as a service provider. So those are just some of the, the basics. I expect there'll be a lot of questions. Um, and again, I'd like to reiterate for those of you who are probably not too technical, please try to stay engaged because this is all very, very important to you as well. So if you're a librarian, you're a researcher, you're a student, you're a postgrad student, uh, then Identity Federation is very important to you. So as the other speakers uh, throw more light on that, uh, I hope there'll be more questions for the interactive discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ioha, uh, for very good and uh, nice presentation. Uh, I think like we earlier said, please, anybody who has uh, questions can post them in the Q&A section so that we can take them after all the presentations uh, have been made. Uh, now, having said this, uh, we can now move on to the next presentation, which is on ensuring a strong identity federation for EduGain. This will be presented by uh, Mark Williams from JISC. Uh, so Mark, can I hand over to you? Yeah, it's actually been um, exactly. presented by my colleague, Alex Stewart, who's our chief technical architect. Oh, he's the one JISC. who... Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, then, uh, then, then, uh, then we present Mr. Alex Tutt, who is the Technical Development Manager of JISC, uh, who will be presenting on the Ensuring a Strong Identity Federation for EduGain. Uh, uh, Alex Tutt is, is Technical Development Manager in JISC Trust and Identity Group. Alex has worked in the UK Federation for 10 years, first in Federation Technical Support, then Team Leader and Development Manager and currently holds the UK Federation Architect role. He's a member of the EduGain Steering Group and EduGain Support Team. His interests are Federation interoperability and metadata propagation. I wish to welcome Mr. Alex Tart and uh, give him the floor. We have 30 minutes to do your presentation. Your time starts now. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will see if, well, good, good uh, afternoon, everyone. My, um, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for that, that introduction. My name is Alex Stewart. Um, uh, as, uh, as was heard there, uh, 10 years working with the UK Federation, and maybe the last two years um, on the EduGain Steering Committee. Uh, every uh, federation that joins EduGain has a steering, uh, has a, uh, a delegate to the, the EduGain Steering Group and um, uh, a deputy, and I've been a deputy to the EduGain Steering Committee uh, for the last two years. Um, I, I have a technical background, so this will be uh, a technical talk, so I will um, try and keep it short and, uh, and also the, the, the relevance to, to the wider community in terms of uh, people who want to use the Federation, um, uh, the kind of researchers and students, um, uh, and, and also librarians and, uh, and so on. Uh, I will see how to um, share my share my screen. Give me a second. No, I... I think that's showing. Is that showing all the screen and the notes and everything? Yes, it is. So you need yes. to go into uh, maybe presentation mode. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to the conference. I, I, do, I do appreciate that. Um, the, the, the presentation will be, um, I've got kind of four parts to that, uh, an introduction of, um, uh, well, I've had, I've had my own introduction. I'll talk a little about the UK Federation and about EduGain structure. Um, I'll talk about how one, one uh, can integrate with, with EduGain. Um, identify as an attribute, the third section 
will be about um, the uh, the data that is is held about um, uh, people who use uh, well the Nigerian Federation, UK Federation, uh, and, and other Edugain federations. Um, the, these are uh, it's a privacy preserving um, framework where the identity providers release only attributes about yourself, uh, and the attributes may be a name or an email address or or or, or, um, a, or, or any attribute. Um, the identity provider only releases what is essential for the the, the service. So there's there's a um, uh, I'll explore a little bit about that later on. Um, and the fourth part, the last part, is about tools. Uh, when Owen asked me to to, to talk about the um, how to ensure a strong identity federation in um, Edugain, I, I feel very much that having good tools for testing and validation are. are ways of, of building the strength and building the quality of, of a federation. So I'll take a bit of time towards the end um, just to list some of those tools. The UK Federation has been a uh, federation um, for about 15 years. Um, my, my colleague Mark, who's on the, the call, probably knows the, the date better I and mean, he has been uh, working since um, uh, since the start of that. Um, and in the early days, the, the UK Federation was um, for UK Federation-based institutions, educational institutions, and services that were not necessarily um, uh, uh, based in the UK. Other national federations uh, were also developed about this time. Each one typically had um, identity providers from that country um, uh, available um, within the federation, and then services registered directly with the, uh, the federation as well. And from a service provider point of view, this was quite inefficient. One would have to register with um, every single federation. There, there, there was no way to share data between, uh, or technical data between the, the, the federations. And I, uh, this was one of the drivers for the Edugain Interfederation Service. Um, there, was, there was a realization that um, uh, this was uh, inefficient and if metadata could be shared and, and, and um, shared between federations, it would make things easier both for the service providers but also the, uh, the identity providers who would have access to um, uh, services that, that, that were registered out with their own federation. I, I'm pretty sure that Mario uh, Rial, who's the, uh, the, the next speaker, will talk a bit about that. So I don't want to, um, to go into that too much. Um, but that was, the, that was the driver for Edge again. Um, over 70 federations are, are members there. Um, and if, you, if one goes to that, that technical site, one can see the federations, uh, the contact details, uh, security contacts, uh, who, who's the, the Edugain, um, uh, the delegate from the National Federation, the deputy, and so on. Um, from a technical, the technical point of view, there's a, a metadata publication service. Um, the Edugain metadata engine takes metadata from all the, 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 the federations that are the member organizations, aggregates it once per hour, and then publishes that um, back out for the member federations to consume. Uh, I, I'll talk in a few slides a, a little bit more, more about that. Um, but but that, that's, that's the, 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 the metadata publication service is the main engine um, in, in Edugain. Uh, and there's a number of uh, tools on top of that, one of which is the, the entity database, which talks about which identity providers and which services are, um, uh, are within, uh, are available within um, Edugain. Uh, and as Owen was saying beforehand, there's, um, uh, uh, there's a number of different uh, databases and services there. By being part of Edugain, you will, um, you will be able to interoperate with those services 
some maybe have licensed content, others maybe open science or open access or, or, or whatever. It, that, that's, that's up to the, um, the service itself. Um, and the last thing on that slide, um, uh, sorry, I do apologize. I have not moved on my slide. That will uh, explain. Um, uh, right, sorry. So this, this is the slide. So I, I, I've, the last couple of minutes I've been talking about this slide, but presenting the other one, I do apologize. The last thing I wanted to say about this particular slide is that there is a, a support um, uh, address for um, uh, edugain, support at edugain.org. And there are um, technical and policy, um, or people who know about the technical and policy um, parts of Edugain who will be able to support you, you as um, Edugain participants uh, or participant organisations, or, or as a as kind of federation operator. I'll move on to the next um, slide. So this is um, how one as a, as a federation integrates with Edugain. Um, as as uh, Owen was saying beforehand, um, by being part of Edugain, there is, there is a, a measure of trust with all the other Edugain participants. Uh, this, this trust is technically embodied in, in SAML metadata. Um, I will talk, yeah, I'll talk about the contents of metadata sometime later on. Um, you as an identity provider or service provider, there, there was a question earlier about how to provide services um, uh, into Edugain. Uh, one would, um, sorry, I've lost that, that thread of it. Um, the, um, the sound metadata has the, the, the technical contents to allow interoperability. I think I'll just kind of skip on rather than go through the, um, uh, the subtitles there. As Owen said, though, the, the Edugain uh, facilitates single sign-on with, with one set of credentials from your um, organization or from the identity provider, um, which will then, um, uh, one will be able to um, uh, attempt to access any of the services within uh, Edugain. And there's a typical flow. It's not just um, SAML, which is the protocol that's used within Edugain, but, but, but federated um, uh, authentication protocols do this. Uh, it, it's quite a messy diagram. I, I think when I started um, uh, learning about federated access, I saw diagrams similar to this and went, well, that's kind of complex. Isn't it easier to make a, a, a simpler diagram? And as I've... Um, uh, as I've got more experience, I found out, no, I, th I think actually there's, there's a certain irreducible complexity to, to federated access um, uh, 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 and, and, and that kind of splitting of the, um, the responsibilities between a service provider that wants to provide a service, doesn't really need to know about identities, and the identity provider, which doesn't necessarily want to uh, provide services, or it wants to provide access to services, but not um, uh, provide the services themselves. And by splitting those, um, uh, those two uh, um, uh, areas of concern, that builds in um, uh, some complexity there. So, so this kind of diagram, I, I've, I don't know how to make it um, any simpler than that. Um, following the steps through, the, the first one is someone using a browser attempts to access uh, a service, a service provider there. Um, the service themselves, if it has access to, well, it could be licensed resources, but it might also be um, an open access uh, resource, but it wants to have some personalization there. So it wants to um, uh, ret retain some information about you during, um, you know, in repeated visits like uh, saved searches or accessibility options or, um, uh, language preferences or, or any, any of those kind of personalizations. You want those to be um, retained um, on second and subsequent uh, accesses. So um, it, the, the, generally the service, well, the service providers 
uh, won't won't just uh, allow access at that point. So they would like to know which is your identity provider, which identity provider can vouch for you. And this is uh, section uh, step two, the IDP discovery. And there's a number of uh, different ways of, of making the that discovery. Um, unfortunately, some of the yeah, not not all of them are optimized for mobile use. Um, I think that's that's something that we as a, a community of federations probably need to do um, uh, better at. Uh, it's something that that there are um, centralized discovery services that um, uh, you know have the promise of offering. Um, uh, sort of good um, discovery uh, to, to mobile devices. So once one, um, uh, coming back to, to, to step two, one goes to, uh, with your browser, go to a resource. The resource says, what's your identity provider? One would then choose the particular identity provider, in this case, within the uh, uh, Nigerian Federation, uh, eduid.nigeria. One's redirected to the identity provider, and there's... Um, uh, an authentication step, username, password, maybe multi-factor authentication, one of these, um, uh, one or more methods. The identity provider verifies that, looks within its identity management system, discovers that that, that, that user account exists, knows some things about that, knows, um, uh, knows some attributes about the uh, the person trying to, or the person who's also authenticating, knows something about the service provider as well, says that this service provider needs certain attributes to operate. For example, this one needs an email address because it's to enable collaboration between different, different people using it, or it needs a name, a display name, or so on. Um, often there'll be an attribute um, uh, called a scoped affiliation, which has two pieces of information in it. Um, the scope, which is, is, um, is, a, is a security domain. It's like a, a domain name. It, it's um, unique for your uh, organization, your, your university. Um, and then there's the affiliation itself, which is um, a kind of coarse grained uh, attribute about what role you have, whether you're a student or an employee or, or um, uh, you just have access to the library or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, service providers may, may make access decisions based on that, that scope and affiliation. But the identity provider knows, should know, what the service provider wants, what it requires, and will then send um, those attributes and the, the time of authentication and so on um, in an assertion back to the service provider. That, that's the... Um, number four on the, um, uh, in the list. And at that point, the service provider looks at the, uh, the, the set of attributes, goes, this, this person uh, is a member of, of a particular university or so on. I'm going to allow them access. They've got an identifier. I'll be able to record this, um, uh, any uh, you know, saved searches or these personalizations, uh, and then provides uh, or can provide access to the, the resource. And, and that's, that, that, that will happen with any kind of federated authentication protocol, I think. Um, the, the part that Edugain does is it, it, it provides a layer of trust between service providers and identity providers. Um, the service provider, uh, also the, the, the person who's trying to access the resource doesn't want to go to a phishing site. When they go, when they go to their service provider, uh, they don't want to be uh, uh, redirected to a, a random page. Um, the service provider uh, will, will redirect them to an identity provider it knows about. Similarly, the identity provider, when someone's authenticated there and it wants to send that personal information, it doesn't just want to send it to um, uh, a random site on the internet. It needs to know the, 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 the characteristics of the... So it needs to know where, where it's going to, to send these attributes. And the service provider and the identity provider, they get to know about each other from the SAML metadata. Um, this is the, the, the technical basis of trust within um, uh, SAML federations, within the UK Federation, within 
uh, the Nigerian Federation and within EDUGAIN as a, as a whole. And that metadata um, contains a number of things. It, it talks about the organization name, um, uh, and this, this is used within these, these discovery, in the IDP discovery services. Um, domain names, identity IDs are an identifier for that. It is kind of technical um, uh, uh, quantity. And I, I mentioned before about scopes as well. Um, and scopes uh, are the, the kind of security domain where, where one comes from. So these are listed in the metadata. Um, display names, logos for, for one's unit, well, a logo for, for one's university or for the, the, the services as well. And that helps in, 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 in discovery. Um, web service endpoints, as I was saying before, one needs to know, the service provider needs to know where the identity provider is and the identity provider needs to know where the service provider is. And then there's also the, the, the public keys for, for the um, XML uh, signatures and the registrar, so um, UK Federation or, or whoever. And because EduGain has maybe, um, there's, there's 4,000, 4, 5,000, there's several thousand entities in here. One has, um, uh, that trust fabric is quite large. It, it's growing all the time. The, the, the graph here shows two different traces. The lower trace is the size of the UK Federation um, metadata going back the, the, the 15 years or so. And in, in 2014, when we joined EduGain, the UK Federation started consuming a lot more metadata. And that's what the, the upper line is, that, that red line. Um, and it's not, it's not slowing down. There's, there's been bumps and so on in the, in the size of that. Um, but we don't see any um, anything that, that will that will slow that down. New federations um, I, are I, I, high. I, Alex, Alex, Hi, Ahmed. We have five yes. more minutes to go. Five minutes. Right, I better hurry. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, and the issue with the metadata size is um, the security properties are calculated over the whole document. Um, uh, and as this, as the metadata size increases, your IDP or the service providers need to um, uh, consume, uh, they, they need to unpack it and do, uh, and, and calculate the signature. Now, from Owen's talk earlier, it looks like EcoConnect are providing the identity providers. So in that case, I'm going to assume that they are, and that's not really of, of importance. Um, uh, and once again, the EduGain integration policies, this is maybe more an EcoConnect thing than, a, um, uh, than something that, that an individual identity provider or a university might need to know about that. I will just say that with the, the, the policies of different federations within EduGain, one can have a very open um, uh, policy, as in one will export everything and one will import all the... Um, all the metadata. I think that needs uh, MDQ. It's a metadata query service which um, reduces the cost, uh, provides a bit more robustness. Whereas if one has a selective um, uh, import and export policy, one needs to actively manage which entities are coming in and out. So uh, needs a bit more work from the uh, the, the federation operator there. Um, The Educating Futures Working Group, I'll, I'll just leave this as a kind of open invitation, I guess. Um, we realise that Educating still is in development. There are still things, there's, there's, there's issues about the, the baseline quality and um, uh, there, there, there are some other issues in terms of service catalogues and so on. We do have um, a kind of shorter term working group for, for the next few months. Uh, I would encourage you to get involved in that if, if one is an IDP operator. Um, or, it, uh, or people from the uh, from Eco Connect themselves. Uh, I think joining that feeding back would be a good um, a good. Uh, it would be good to hear from from using that. Uh, this is going to be quite. Oh, this is quite a, a technical section, and I realise I've got only a few minutes. I think I am going to skip through that. There's a number of identifiers. I think as a, as a 
as an older federation, the UK Federation has found it difficult to transition to newer ways of working. I, I feel that the, the, the Nigerian Federation, this is a new federation within Edge Again. I think you've got um, a, a good opportunity to do current best practice rather than something that the UK Federation does. You know, we, we, are, we are trying to move to a, a higher assurance and a more modern um, uh, federation. I, I feel that um, as, a, as a younger federation, you've got a, um, uh, an opportunity there to, to use the best current practice. I listed some identifiers. This is a technical detail, but I think your IDP should kind of release all of them. I think that's, that's um, there rather than say, suck with, with old versions. Uh, we talked about scoped affiliation. There's a lot of the authorization models in there. So this will be about licensing uh, issues. Um, there's something about assurance frameworks there, but I think I'll just skip through that. And the tools. Um, one of the strengths, I think, in Edugain are the, the tools that one can use to look at um, testing and, valid, um, and um, verifying metadata. We've got something in the UK Federation where any anyone who has an account at a, an Edugain identity provider can, um, can go to that. Um, it, uh, it allows you to see which attributes um, your IDP is, is releasing to, to RSP. Edugain has, has a similar one there in the Edugain attribute release check. Um, I'll ignore that, that second um, bullet point. And there are also automated tools um, there. And, and the, for example, the Edugain connectivity check will look through uh, every morning at kind of 4 a.m. Central European time. Um, it, it, it just kind of pings, it sends an authentication request to all the IDPs and checks whether they're responsive, whether there's a login page that comes back. Uh, and one can, as an IDP operator, one could then drill down into that and see whether one is, um, one is connected. Uh, or if there's a, a connectivity problem with one's IDP. And I think those last two slides, sorry, I, I, I rambled for, for way too long earlier on. I, I, think, I think having these kind of testing um, tools and knowing how to use those, I think builds a technical quality and, um, within, within Edugain. Um, a lot of the Edugain tools, you know, um, they're, they're available on the uh, Edugain technical website that, um, that uh, I gave the URL to beforehand. And I would encourage you if, if, as an IDP operator um, to go and use those and, and to, to have the, uh, the best identity provider that, that, that one can have. At that point, I'll say thank you very much for uh, uh, bearing with my presentation. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Alex. Um, we'll now move on to the last presentation which will be made by Mario Rell, and it's going to be on joining EduGain, the opportunities for Nigerian research and education uh, network. Mr. Um, Mario Rell is a senior research engagement and support officer, giant, giant. Uh, he graduated in higher energy physics in 1992 from the second university of Rome, for Begal. He holds a PhD in higher energy physics from the University of Patel, Germany in 1997. He participated in the first large international projects on grids, including EU Mediterranean collaboration projects like uh, he made grid support in 2010 to 2012. He joined the Italian Research and Education Network in 2006, where he has been working on the IP version 6 compliance of grid middleware and the activities of the GN4-1 and GN4-2, GN4-3 of giant uh, projects. In 2011, he has been actively involved in the EU Latin American collaboration project, ELKIRA, aimed at supporting identity federations cloud services and advanced networking services in South America. He has been the network support coordinator, EGI, from 2010 to 2012, 
He subsequently joined the CARB Cloud activities between 2014 and 2018, dealing with automation of the deployment of OpenStack clusters in Italy. He joined the activities of IDEM, the Italian Identity Federation in 2018 to 2019. Since July, 2019, he's an Amsterdam working at the Giant Association in the research engagement and support team and contributing to the development activities of edu teams, a community oriented AI solution for research collaboration. It is my honor to present to you Mr. Mario for his presentation. Mr. Mario, over to you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. How are you? I hope you can hear me well. I'm not managing to start my video. I don't know why, but um, I mean, I don't know if the host can help me here because uh, I got a message stating that uh, I cannot start the video. Uh, anyhow, um, I will try to see if you, I can share my screen so that you can see my slides just a second. Um, okay. Oh, uh, start my video. Okay, so now it works. Good. Uh, do you see my, my slides? Yes, we can see them, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, O1 Echo Connect for a while, and now it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be uh, at this event and uh, be able to, let's say, celebrate together um, the fact that um, the Nigerian Federation now joined it again recently. So I'll, uh, I, I, I know that sticking to time sometimes hard, so I'll try to do my best as well. Um, today, I want to cover shortly, I mean, since I think both, um, uh, I mean, Owen and Alex have covered this, uh, what is EduGain? Uh, how did it start and grow? The basic working, working principle. But again, I will quickly go through them because I think we already uh, heard about them. And I will mention the main, let's say, use case covered by EduGain, which is the Interfederation Access to Services. And then I will try to focus on uh, bringing some kind of positive views on the opportunities that EduGain is bringing to Nigerian researchers. And I think that should be mostly the focus on my talk, I think. Uh, I will shortly mention again the challenge and challenges and, and the evolution of EduGain. So, you know, we got the message that EduGain is an interfederation service that connects identity federations around the world and uh, simplifies access to content, services, and resources. For the benefit of the global research and education community, currently it comprises over 74 participant federations. There are six candidates, I think, and Africa is really taking over here. It's good. Um, we get uh, new federations from, from Africa joining uh, like, like soon. Uh, and currently there's more than 8,000 entities, so identity or service, 8,200 services in EduGain. You see, EduGain doesn't imply that a federation needs to commit all of uh, its resources to EduGain, but a fraction of them, let's say, there's no need to, of course, to commit all the resources. Now, what was it again 10 years ago? And this is a nice slide. I like it a lot because I found it back looking at my past slide decks. I mean, Edugain, and I actually attended a training 10 years ago where it, this was what people were reporting about Edugain. Edugain is a, so basically uh, almost 12 years ago now. I mean, yeah. So it's circa 2010. So it was a project by Giant based on SAM. It's not a federation, it's a, a interfederation services. And it covered just a bunch of European countries, the ones that you see colored in green in this map, Croatia, Czech Republic, Germany, Poland, Finland, and Switzerland. What happened in the meanwhile? Well, this is what happened in the meanwhile, right? So can we call it a success? I would say so. I mean, now, Edugain is a, the global, the global enable for, for research and education for this community. We have 74 identity federations joined. As I mentioned, there are more than 4,600 identity providers, let's say institutions, and more than 3,500 uh, service providers, federated services. 
And uh, there are six candidates uh, currently, and you see there is room for uh, covering now mostly South America and Africa that are and the missing bits in Asia, and then we can really see that uh, Edugain will be worldwide spread. This is the same view, uh, not related to Edugain, but just to the existing federations in the world. So some of these federations that you see here are taken from the Refed website from a tool called the Metadata Explorer Toolkit. Um, again, it's a very useful tool. It's a nice, interesting uh, website for those who are managing um, federations. So I encourage you to take a look at um, this, uh, uh, let's say, really multilateral international support body called REFED, or Social Education Federation Group. It's really open. It's an open community. There's a, there's a work plan every year to improve uh, everything around federations. And these slides, it's a bit self-celebrating again. I mean, basically showing that in the last 10 years, it again grew has been, has been growing constantly, grew constantly. Uh, it didn't grow uh, in isolation. There were, of course, the national initiatives, the national federation to the right side of this slide, and major initiative and projects like REFEDS, as I already mentioned, the ARC project, which I had the honor to be involved in, uh, other initiatives like Film 4 r and the Kantara initiative. So it's really a worldwide community uh, around uh, AI, in research and education. You know, I mean, we have seen this already. I think also Owen mentioned uh, an identity federation is a collection of organization that agree to interoperate under certain rule set. These rule set are basically legal frameworks, policies, and technical profiles. An identity federation is the key trust enable and, and provide the necessary trust and security to exchange your organization identity, and info identity information to access services within the federation. So, I do id.ng does this role, this job in Nigeria. It's basically clustering together services and identities and ensuring they can trust each other. There's two kind of two main kind of federation architecture. One is called full mesh. Basically, it's uh, an, an architecture where every entity talks to every other entity directly. So you need to replicate the metadata you know, to, to, to get to know each other and get to talk to each other, uh, entities, IDPs and the SPs need to exchange metadata. And in a full mesh federation, everyone talks to everybody else, right? I, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time in this because it's not the focus. This is more generic. It's not the focus on my talk. Uh, and this again is another approach, the hub and spoke federations where there is a central hub uh, and uh, acting as a, you know, the, the way for everyone to talk for everybody else. So it is a different approach. There's a advantages and disadvantages with respect to full mesh. There are well-known, uh, I mean, there are well-known, it's uh, hub and spoke federation in Edugain as well. The central hub is the one who needs to hold the metadata of everybody. There's no need to replicate the metadata of everyone everywhere in an urban spoke federation. Everything, everything happens through the central hub. And it's, of course, a single point of failure if you implement such an architecture, uh, if you will ever do that. I mean, uh, I mean, talking generically, you need to make this uh, single point of failure highly available and carefully protected, of course. You know, entities are, as Alex mentioned, I mean, are the, at the heart of, of the federations. Basically, uh, entities register uh, metadata into the federation feed. The federation feed is what defines who is in and who is not in, in the federation. The federation validates and aggregates the entity metadata, creating one or more federation feed, feeds, and, uh, and then signs and distributes this metadata. So, uh, and uh, for example, eduid.ng has this URL that you see there where the metadata of the Nigerian Federation are published. So role of the Federation, key, um, you know, manager of the trust in the community, um, and really the, the holder of the metadata gathers the metadata of the entity, assigns them. So it acts as a trusted party. So, it has an important role. All this is based on SAM. Again, I mean, I'll leave you in the slides all the, the details, but SAM is the, the protocol 
the, the security assertion markup language that we use is the de facto standard for identity federation. It is a, it is made of a, it's an OSIS standard and it has been is made of different building blocks. I mean now again, um, just to mention for you to have let's say a reference, the building blocks of Samla profile bindings, protocols, and assertions. You know, assertions are the basic assertion, security assertion that are there to 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 um, to make a security statement about user or principles. And uh, protocols are basically the protocols used to, uh, to 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 communicate and to transfer these assertions. The bindings are a mapping of some protocols onto standard messaging and communication protocol. And profile are the high level use cases implementation. The one that we use in, in federation, mostly use in federation is called the single sign-on, web single sign-on. There is then the concept of the metadata that you have seen, really the stream of the definition of who is inside a federation and the authentication context, which is again, um, a context specifying detail uh, information on the types and strengths of authentication you'll be using. This is just a, a you know a top of an iceberg of a, of a topic, just to give you uh, you know a technical feel of what. And again, this is I think the last technical slide I have really in, into into uh, my talk is about how basically this whole thing works. It works as Alex mentioned through attribute exchange. Uh, when a user attempts to access a service uh, provider protected site, it usually asks the user identity provider to provide one or, one or more specific identity attributes. So basically, you see that uh, you you move from attributes about the inform about the users that are stored in a local um, identity management system like the LDAP of a given university through a layer that en enables this multi-domain exchange of information, which is called the identity provider. And then this information is sent to an application where uh, these attributes are used uh, and basically to authorize the user to access the service. The main use case of it again is interfederation, right? So as again, as Alex and Owen mentioned before me, allowing users to access, potentially access services worldwide, right? Through all uh, the, the whole of it again. Bear in mind, it doesn't count for free. It doesn't imply being in Edugain as a university or as a service doesn't imply that you can actually implement one-to-one -one communication everywhere because bear in mind that authorization in the end is decided by the services themselves. But Edugain is the enable of, of this. So if you have the right attribute release to a service, if there are proper deals in place, authorization is a is agreed, let's say, between an IDPSP, then EduGain enables this. So basically, um, I just wanted to warn you, EduGain is an enabling mechanism. It's not um, it's not a golden Pandora of free services for everyone everywhere. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, now, I want to write. OK, so it's an enabling mechanism. Uh, and again, as, I, as Alex, Alex already mentioned, is based on the metadata distribution service. It again acts in practice as a federation would do. So gathers the metadata of the different federations, uh, validates them, and creates its own stream of metadata through the MDS, signs and distributes the metadata, and then uh, the federation will distribute back the, those the stream of metadata to everyone in Edugain. So basically, you see there is a uh, an upstream of a federation metadata, and there is also a downstream of Edugain metadata once once the the merging is done by the MDS. Basically, it acts again as a federation would do, as a trust party signing and distributing the metadata uh, uh, upstream feed of the various federations. So, it builds its own metadata stream. And I think Alex mentioned to you that I mean this is growing in size, MDQ would be a protocol to use. But I mean, technical matters we can discuss in any other occasions. It's a complex ecosystem as such. It's growing, it's uh, involving federations, but also research infrastructure and proxies. Proxies are aggregation point for services to, to, to meet identities and identities to meet services. So uh, now in the game, we have uh, 
we have um, identities, services, but also proxy toward services or proxy toward identities. And, um, and we have this, remember that we have both hub and spoke and full mesh federations. It's a growing uh, ecosystem in complexity with respect to the previous slide that we've seen in 2010. Also, Alex mentioned this, but I don't want to spend too much time. There's a, there's a set of very well-tuned services to, to, to monitor Edugain and to monitor the quality of the metadata, the health of the metadata, to validate your own stream of metadata. Uh, and there's a set of services that you can, uh, that are basic there to, to provide specific answer, to check whether uh, you know, uh, an IDP is releasing properly entities, attributes to an SP, and so on. And there is also an NFTX website where basically we are gathering um, statistics, pseudo-anonymized statistics on who, which IDP talks to which SP or which are the most popular service provider in your federation in Edugain and so on. Another tool which has recently made available in a, in a, in a, in a beta phase, in a beta phase is Edugain reporting. It's again uh, a very a very nice tool to be used as a, by federations to build their own uh, reports, get notified by email about issues related to uh, the handling of the federation. Uh, it's basically to examine the technical compliance of the federation and it gives you a lot of information on, for example, the backends that are used or the, the implementations that are used by the various uh, federation entities. Now, again. It's an enabler now towards uh, edu teams, towards proxies, towards uh, student validation services. It's a, it's, a, it's a gateway towards the My Academic ID, so student mobility services, and towards uh, publishers, right? So online publishers and library uh, related services. So think of Edugain as a, as a very um, wide and, uh, and large uh, enabler of accessing services related to the research and education. Some of them are a virtual organization in research infrastructure. Some are related to, again, to the options for merchants and, and companies to be sure that an identity is really the one of a student. So for example, to allow discounts and other are related to mobility. Um, my academic ID, for example, it's a, it's a safe identity layer that has been built around uh, uh, student mobility. Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's an access layer that uh, interfaces services related to, uh, to, uh, to the Erasmus project, the fact that students travel and, you know, do these cultural exchanges in Europe, and, and it interconnects services and uh, identities, and also its interface to the IDAS, which is the governmental IDs. Um, now, it's just to give you flavor of what you can do. I, I, I acknowledge I don't have time to enter the details now, but Edugain is an enabler uh, to, to, to different services. Edugain is also uh, you know, part of a layer, the identity layer, which has been identified by the so-called art blueprint architecture. This architecture is a kind of a standard model uh, for... for uh, identities and services to interact. It's a very popular uh, architecture, reference architecture, when you need to talk to a community, it's made of layers and has been built uh, with time by the community and acknowledged that there are different identity layer on top. Uh, of course, I do gain some, but also X509 and other ways of identifying users, that there is a, a central proxy layer in between identities and services and, uh, and then in the end, there are different kinds of services as well accessed by the communities. So uh, just to say that when you talk at again, you normally talk about open protocols and standards, and standards are modeled by this architecture, which is very powerful when you need to enroll a new community and talk about their requirements, where they, what could they need in terms of uh, jumping on board of the game. So again, um, at the game, uh, is a federated identity that can be used on a wide stack of local and global services. Bear in mind that when you, you know, when you set up your identity provider, it takes time. You need to follow an tool or your tool, you are skilled. It takes some time. There is a learning curve and it's not trivial to set up an identity, a well-forged identity provider compliant with the right entity categories, providing the right attributes. 
But then on top of that identity provider, you basically have a whole stack of services that can be built uh, and accessed through your identity provider. Some of them can be local services. Like I, I took one of the university here that are part of the Nigerian Federation that could have, you know, the bike rental services of the university or the current, the, the local library or housing for students. So services that do not necessarily, let's say, uh, join it again, uh, but they, they are still provided through the IDP, the same IDP you can use if you want to access the gain services. And then, of course, there are the national services. And now we have a federation in Nigeria to handle this. There is the Edugain layer, which basically makes you peer with services uh, worldwide. But then there's also the access to infrastructures, to research collaboration services, um, online publishers uh, or public providers, vendors, as I mentioned, and student mobility. So basically, it, it has a learning curve. It is, it is a heavy initially, but it's, it's, uh, it's, you, know, you know, it's the bridge towards uh, a large set of useful services for, for research and education. This is just an attempt to mention a few of the tools that have been made available through, uh, let's say, through the federations. So basically through Edugain. Uh, most of these tools are, some of these tools are open source, others are a paid service like, like Zoom. But the important message here is that all these services can be federated. And so once your university deploys the identity provider, you're potentially entitling your students to access you know, uh, e-learning tools, collaboration tools, content management systems, cloud infrastructures, uh, sync and share storage, you know, real-time communication, publishers online. You know, um, it's really uh, wonderful to see the rich variety of services that you can actually federate. And this is not an exhaustive list. Now, the few minutes I've left, I'd like to throw some examples of services that are currently in the game that are potentially made accessible to the Nigerian Federation being in the game. One example, I was working on this, so it's uh, it's dear to me. Uh, it's the, the, the Gar Cloud. The Gar Cloud. It's a uh, it's um, it, it's a hybrid platform. It's it's a actually a private platform based on OpenStack, made made available for. Uh, the, the Italian uh, academic and research institutions, but through Edugain, it's also made available to students or uh, users worldwide. There is an authorization bit, so it's not a free cloud provider to everyone in the academia, but they, they for example, had like small projects made available to students upon request. The important concept here is that Keystone, which is the identity layer in OpenStack can be configured as a SAM ident uh, yeah as a SAM service provider. So basically what you can do is to access OpenStack uh, through your identity provider. And this is actually already there. I'm currently accessing this cloud using my giant staff identity provider. Another example of a, a wonderful service that is made available by Renatere is Rendezvous. Rendezvous is a real-time communication. So basically uh, uh, a video conferencing system and uh, it's federated in, uh, in Edu game. So basically it's easy to create a, a room and talk to people wow. using Rendezvous. So this is again, not necessarily, you know, it's real-time communication, not necessarily just a web catalog or uh, published by UK Federation that Siever Clinical Skills in it again, it's, it's basically a learning platform for improving skills of nurse, nurses. And um, again, this is made available uh, to Edugain, through Edugain. So now you have eduid.ng as a new federation, what kind of services could you add? Well, you could add, of course, as Owen was mentioning, library resources, training platforms, or collaboration platforms, content, uh, uh, customer relation management systems like RT, uh, as I mentioned, video conferencing services, uh, private hybrid cloud platform like OpenStack, sharing, sync and share services like on cloud, or specific storage services to, uh, uh, for specific communities or file sender, or online data repositories. There's, there's really, uh, almost no limit to the, to, to the variety of services you can add to your federation. 
and make them available uh, as, as in a national pool of services and then through it again, make them available worldwide. So you're basically boosting a lot the, the possibility for your services to get users from everywhere and, uh, and vice versa. Of course, you're entitling your user to be able to access services everywhere. Uh, why should institutions join it again? Well, it again keeps being the central main service at, at the authentication level, right? As we have seen for online research and education services worldwide, see the mobility services, the search collaboration services, infrastructural services, you know, we tend to split these two flavors of proxies, let's say, the research collaborations that, uh, that they are the only AI towards their service and the more generic infrastructure services like, uh, I don't know, the EGI Federated Cloud. Um, so are you five more minutes for you? Sorry, how many minutes? Five, 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 five. minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine with that. Thank you. My, so, my home institutional credentials acquire additional value. You know, you let your staff and researchers uh, really exploit the benefit of being affiliated with your university once you are in it again. Um, and as again, uh, as I mentioned, it goes well beyond the initial use case for which the game was born, right? Just cross federation, uh, you know web-based services. Now we, you can plug it again to higher stack services, to ask AI or to communication, uh, search collaboration proxies. So the affiliation to my home organization requires a lot of value if my institution is in it again. For a student would be a honor and a privilege to be affiliated to your university. Now, how can federations support institutions to join in general? Well, it is a step to deploy the initial components to get acquainted to the best practices, the right procedures, and so on. There are a set of uh, how-tos and guides made available by the community. Uh, I'm just throwing an example provided by GAR. There's, of course, a lot of other guides worldwide. Uh, take a look at the REFETS website for these as well. Uh, you. You could, as a, as, a, as a federation, decide to become an IDP cloud manager, you know, cloud provider. This is a choice that some uh, NRANs have done. You know, the Czech, uh, the Czech Republic, French, Italians, I think they do that for various reasons. Maybe because they are the, some of their institutions are hospitals, so they don't have skills really to deploy their own IDP. So a federation could be could become to, could decide to become a cloud provider of identity for uh, for universities or institutions, and there are also a set of tools or toolkits like the Generalizable Toolkit. Take a look if you want; it helps you to let's say deploy to scale um, a set of identity providers. Basically, automation tools, the Bob's tools to deploy the Shibboleth IDP, for example. I'm almost done. We still miss, I have to say, a very friendly and uh, you know exhaustive service catalog in Edugain. There were multiple attempts done in the past. Uh, now I know that the incubator task is working on this. Uh, the whole idea about this is to rely on um, SPs, metadata curation carried out by the SP managers, uh, or, and provide also deployable solution which can be endorsed by national federation because. You know, while disseminating about it again, the first question you get, where do I get the wonderful list, the list of these wonderful services I can access if I join it again? The answer is, is there's not straightforward user-friendly interface, unfortunately. Uh, okay, these are, these are the service categories that are being defined, but I mean, the, the important message that I want to give is that you can use the Edugain entity database at the moment, which is, you know, what looks similar to a catalog or the Metadata Explorer Toolkit from Refeds, and bear with this uh, lack of the, let's say, perfect user-friendly catalog at the moment. The challenges have been, you know, met by the game in the years. There were few federations, uh, few organizations, uh, but I think basically Edugain as a community has managed to find a way out of all the challenges that you got introducing a new concept like entity categories. You know, the attribute release was the main problem for the game for years. As an IDP, I'm reluctant to release information about my users to services. 
And this was a, this was a long lasting problem in the game. Uh, now uh, there's an there's an evolution. There's a there's a there's a working group working on a baseline expectation for the game, basically uh, with the aim to improve the user experience for more interoperable and consistent service delivery. Yeah, and uh, you know where to set the bar to uh, accept entities in edu game so be as open minded as possible but also make sure that the user doesn't experience too too much problem let's say um also alex mentioned this there is an edu game futures working group uh, which is currently working uh, uh, on uh, reviewing some basic concepts around the game uh, focusing on the current issues um trying to you know trying to come up with a, a more um a more let's say interoperable system and to make sure that uh, the current challenges are addressed so this working group will review the baseline expectation document identify new key issues review the governance model come up in the end with a deliverable which uh, a document with a set of recommendation to, for a game. Now, um, conclusions, Edugain is still the central service for AI in the domain of global research and education worldwide. It has been growing constantly, and now we have more than 8,000 entities, uh, entities meaning mostly IDPs or SPs. So um, it has a learning curve. Uh, there, are, there is room for improvement in Edugain. It's a big living body if you want. It's constantly improving to enhance the overall user experience. And as I mentioned, there must, I mean, there's a baseline expectation and again, futures working groups. And recently new entity categories have been proposed. Entity categories are a way to, let's say, to make attribute release smoother and uh, enhance a level of assurance and trust between entities. I think I'm done. Um, Feel free to to ask me anything. I and uh, again, thank you for. Well, it, it's good that you are done because I'm about to ask you to round off. Thank you very much. Really, uh, guys, we are really grateful to all the beautiful presentations uh, made. I think we should now be running into the question and answer sessions or the interactive panel discussion. I have a couple of questions that have been asked, and uh, just about three. And uh, I think we'll run through them quickly before we conclude. And uh, the first question came from Muntak Abube, and he's asking, how can Identity Federation promote local contents? I uh, didn't uh, uh, send this question to any specific uh, speaker. So I think any one of you can really attempt to answer this question. How can Identity Federation promote local contents? Mario? Well, uh, let me have a crack at that. So oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, before um, any, some of the international speakers maybe contribute. Um, what's very important, and I think uh, Mario did uh, allude to it, is that within the Nigerian Identity Federation, you know, an institution might have a service or some content that they want to share um, with other other institutions, you know, and so uh, leveraging the uh, identity federation where each uh, institution is uh, has an identity provider within the federation, then uh, a single institution itself could also act as a service provider, um, giving access to to that to that particular service. So, in answer to his question. Um, yes, if there is content that uh, an institution wants to share, what really makes it viable is if there are many IDPs within the Federation. So uh, at the moment we have, uh, I think there's a, you can actually go to a website called uh, met.refeds.org and you can actually see all the federations and the number of entities that each uh, Federation has. So I might be going beyond what uh, the question was about, but for me, it is very important that more and more institutions join the, 
uh, eduid.ng because what that does, it also makes the community uh, a whole lot stronger. So if you look at some of the initiatives that are uh, being uh, looked at by the likes of TED Fund and national repositories, it becomes easier if we can approach a TED Fund or some of these other national stakeholders and say, hey, look, within the Nigerian Identity Federation, there are X number of IDPs, which represent all the university institutions and all their users ready to be able to access uh, uh, resources and content in a secure in a secure and trusted manner. So I, I think the more the more IDPs we have, it strengthens that business case, so to speak, or, or use case. And the more identity providers we have, then the more incentives there are for local local content provision because they think, all right, there's a trusted constituency here where I can have domains and circles of trust to offer my content and services. So I think that was just a bit. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Yeah, okay. Mario? Well, I think uh, I think you answer, Owen, basically, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's plenty of opportunities, I guess, for a federation to get in touch with the home institutions and, and get to know, I don't know, the Department of Archaeology of a given university or the, of a new library that could become a service provider. There is some technical work to do normally when you federate a service, but uh, this always pays back in terms of, uh, of work done and efforts done because... Uh, suddenly there's a, there's a new catalog made available to the community, for example. So I encourage you to talk to each other and get to know your community as much as possible. Okay. Alex? Yeah, I, I would like to, um, sorry, yeah, uh, to, to, to echo that, the, what, what Owen and Mario have said. Um, there, there's definitely the, the business case of having more, more identity providers in there. Uh, running the service provider is a different skill set than running an identity provider or an identity management system. Um, and, and that's much more of a kind of web development or web integration um, uh, kind of skill set there. Uh, we do have, there are some uh, universities in the UK Federation that federate hundreds of their internal services. I mean, either for that in that, individual university or for use within the UK so so there are there are some of them that do that and they build up pockets of expertise they, they build up um, teams of expertise in that service provision so um, uh, yeah I mean echoing what Mario said that there is there is some kind of technical work there but it's it's then um, uh, then there's that benefit uh, to the, the the mission okay it'd be nice as well uh, sorry if Mark could share the little insights that you gave us just before uh, the uh, this session started. Yeah, so I guess it's slightly connected in the sense that um, obviously in the UK we're lucky we've got GIST collections which is part of GIST which does the content procurement on behalf of the entire sector um, um, and we've actually had some university-based resources come into wider spread use because we can do that. Um, and GIST Collections also operates by having a model license. So all the content providers sign the same license, counter stats for the library. And one of the things we require is single sign-on access by the UK Federation. So people know if they look at, for example, the GIST Collections catalog, not 100%, but you know, 99% of all resources in that catalog we're offering our community is going to be SSO provided. So that mm. provides a really good baseline for everything. Yeah. But thank you very much. Um, let's move to the second question. This too is not targeted at any uh, one of the speakers. It leads, since membership will not be free on the long run, how will you handle or manage defaulters? That is to say, those who fail to pay subscription membership fees as and when due. Will the failure of defaulters affect continuous services to other members? Who wants to take this one? Um, well, um, uh, it depends really on what, what the, the models uh, are, and um, I guess we will probably want to um, take uh, see what other federations are doing in that in that area. 
like I said, at the moment, uh, it is free, but yes, we're going to have to look at those models. Um, I'm just curious from more experienced practitioners uh, how they've uh, handled such uh, scenarios. I can see Mario's kind of got a smile on his face. Uh, so I'm just wondering for more mature identity federations, is this an issue? Or do you have a kind of funding model that basically alleviates the, the, the question that's being asked? Well, I mean, I was, sorry, I was smiling because of course, it's a, it's a, it's a very clever question. I think, um, well, I, I basically, uh, I can mention that for example, um, the, 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 in Italy, the, these services are uh, basically bundled together with uh, with uh, what you get when you join the network itself. So it's bundled to the network connectivity. Uh, this model doesn't apply everywhere, of course. Um, you know, I mean, in, uh, in many cases, if universities see a benefit for the users, I think that is the, the key, let's say, hook to, to, to bootstrap and, and make sure that they will commit and invest in any case, just because they don't want to, you know, the burden to hear the user saying, oh, why can't I access this service anymore? Or uh, be, because a user that is, a, that is a, a user, I think it's the best insurance for the future of anything to sustain, uh, to be sustained. So, I mean, there are different models, different funding models, I think, uh, around the world. Some federations basically bound, uh, bundled together the fact that you uh, access the federation or you're part of a federation to the fact that you're connected to the national network. So you have a fee for the connectivity, which gives you then added value while you join uh, the national federation. Uh, in general, talking in general, I think these things fly if users, uh, you know, see the benefit and, and push uh, and they have this, this kind of uh, natural push towards um, ensuring that this service will be available. Let's say I don't know, adoption itself is the best insurance for, for the future. Then I don't think that as such, there are no possible uh, ways to sustain the, 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 the Federation. Normally, you know, uh, you, you can build light, light human organizations that don't require mm. heavy, heavy loads in that respect. So, I mean, uh, Max, uh, thank you for that, Mario. So, I mean, just to, uh, to answer the question, you know, we're exploring different um, models um, for the mid to longer term sustainability of the, the Federation. And it's not beyond the uh, uh, possibility that we could um, approach the likes of TEDFUN and see if they're willing to give uh, interventions for the sustenance of uh, the infrastructure. So everything's really on the table and we'll be looking at seeing what, what best or how best we can, uh, we can fund that. Okay, okay. Let me quickly move to the next question. And this one is uh, targeted at Alex. It's, uh, it's from Victor Murinde. He says, thank you, Alex, for your interesting presentation on EduGain. How is EduGain managed and how will stakeholders have say in the governance of EduGain platforms? Alex? Thank you, thank you, Victor. Um, I appreciate that. Um, edu uh, this is partly mine. I, I hope Mario will also uh, provide something after this. Um, from my point, from my point of view, uh, Edugain governance is um, provided by the Edugain member federations themselves. The, those are the members of Edugain. Each member federation has a um, uh, has a a, a delegate to, to the Edugain Steering Committee, and there are one or more deputies there. Um, the Edugain Steering Committee has a mailing list, and we meet, I think it's quarterly, uh, every uh, four times a year. Um, and that, uh, that's where the, the, the matters uh, of interest uh, are discussed. Um, there is a formal voting mechanism but in the two years I've been there, I don't think there's been there's been a, a, a vote on any uh, any issue. Um, one of the things that the Edugain Futures Working Group is doing is looking um, at whether we need to to, to change that that governance model. Um, 
uh, of one member, one vote. Uh, I, I'm I, that's open as far as I'm concerned. Um, and when you say edu-game platforms, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Victor, about that. If it's the edu-game service itself, I think it goes through the edu-game steering committee. If it's individual services, you probably have to, to look at the, um, uh, the, the federations that register those, those services. Okay. Well, I also refeds, it's a very, refeds is a very open body where where uh, you know issues around federations at any levels from from service catalogs or or from the need of new entity categories or anything which basically relates to federation is discussed totally open openly and uh, refeds meets a couple of times per year if i'm not wrong and uh, in usually co-locating with major 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 events but it's a uh, it's a wonderful community. I encourage you to take a look at all the work that is done openly, inclusively on the Refed uh, platform, let's say website. Hmm. Okay, Mark, anything to add? Um, no, not really. I was just replying to the previous question about the, the Rolo GIS model license and we can probably share that with the community if they want oh. to have a look at what we require of the publishers. Um, just coming back to the funding of federations, we're very similar to um, Italy in the sense we're funded by our NREN, but we have recently introduced um, um, charging for commercial service providers because we put them into it edge again. We feel that if they pay for that, but that, that's service. And we also do, because we've got a lot of student verification going on, um, we charge, we've got a service called Verified, which I think a similar one is in Academia for Jeon. And essentially that's charging my uni days, sheer ID, those sorts of student verification discount providers to be in the Federation. Um, and that's helping us do more because we can do the basic things of the Federation with our funding, but to do some of the things Alex has talked about, we need a bit more money, frankly, to do them. And, that's why we're doing it. So it's a hybrid model. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, we have one more last question. Uh, and that is coming again from Muntak Abube. And uh, he's asking the, the last speaker mentioned student mobility. I think he's referring to Mario. Uh, please, can you share more on that, Mario? Yeah, I mean, that refers to student mobility as such. So. The fact that, uh, the, I mean, I was throwing a specific examples of what the European Commission has been requiring, uh, namely that everything related to the Erasmus project, which is a cultural exchange student mobility program, uh, be handled paperless, be handled electronically. Uh, and uh, so basically, and that implied to standardize uh, the European student identifier that implied also the possibility uh, to integrate the governmental IDs and link them to the Edugain identities. So what you call the IDAS identities, which are the ones owned by citizens in, in uh, Europe. Um, so mobility in that respect stood for um, mostly um, the, the Erasmus project, Erasmus Plus project, which uh, for example, uh, is, is uh, you know pushing forward the adoption of um, Edugain because students will then authenticate using Edugain to these online services and in some countries we are seeing that this is pushing forward the adoption of the spawning of new identity providers in universities mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's, it doesn't sorry for the misunderstanding it didn't refer of course to mobile clients or OpenID Connect or anything it was student mobility in this respect I don't know if this was the misunderstanding mm -hmm. Before we, before we wrap up, Shafi, um, um, I notice in, in, um, among the uh, participants, we have um, Mahmoud Mohamed, the technical uh, assistant to the Honorable Minister of Education. And uh, I think we still have Omar Owaya from Wakran here. So um, Mahmoud, if I could allow you to, to speak, um, I'd just like to get your, your maybe your, your, your comments, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Owen. Uh, actually, uh, I really enjoyed the entire presentation because I, I actually shifted uh, several meetings 
when I noticed you're going to be talking about ID systems and uh, uh, the federation uh, edu educate and so on. So actually, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I would be briefing my colleague, the director uh, ICT in the Federal Ministry of Education, uh, what I have just learned. And because we have uh, some work going on regarding education identity in general as a policy uh, and an implementation strategy. So I think this is uh, really good to hear and to have a good grasp of what is happening out there uh, because uh, <clears throat> the firm of education tries to take in firstly the basic education sector first and then uh, in terms of policy and then moving on to tertiary. So we're just coming to that uh, when we talk about also ICT in education and so on. Now, when you talk about open systems in the morning and uh, open research and open uh, science, uh, it refers back uh, for me to the policies uh, because the Federal Ministry of Education is really moving towards more open resources, open systems. So uh, it's good to hear that uh, uh, in this uh, panel discussion, that we're talking about how to actually get researchers and scholars onto a much wider uh, terrain and uh, have resources, resources available. Because part of the problem, somebody did, did ask about funding. I think this is a major, major concern uh, over here. And uh, I would as such like to have much more uh, conversations uh, with yourself, uh, Omo, and anybody else you think that uh, we should have uh, a closer meeting uh, so that we have a clear understanding on how to uh, move forward on, on, on the initiatives I have seen here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud. Um, um, Omo Wai is no stranger to to us and to the audience, I suspect. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, the Identity Federation is operational and we've joined Edugain, a lot of that is down to the support we've had from WACREN and uh, Omar's uh, personal time and investment in ensuring that uh, the Federation runs and is operational. And uh, so I'd like to thank you for all the the work and support he's done on behalf of Nigeria as, uh, as also uh, Mario. But um, Omar, I know you, there's some other activities that are going on with uh, WACREN with regards um, academic identity. I'd uh, just be curious to know what's <laughs> happening in, in what ways does that really uh, relate to a co-connect? Obviously, we're really happy to be the first um, West African NREN to be uh, joining EduGain. Um, but we'd just like to know from your perspective, what else is happening from the regional perspective? Thank you. First of all, Mahmoud, yes, I, as soon as you can, I'm happy to just catch up and chat about what we can, how we can sort of contribute to your plans. That's what we've been trying to sort of um, the kind of interest we've been trying to stimulate with the Open Science Symposia is exactly direct targeted at that kind of result. So looking forward to that contact. And yes, um, oh, and I, there's so much to talk about and everybody's talked already. But some of the things I wanted to highlight is that we need to sort of look at identity uh, in our context, you know, and try and use it to support what we already have. So this, it means, uh, I think um, Alex was sort of touched on some of, some of, some of that. We, we don't necessarily have to um, reinvent the wheel. We should be able to look, look at our environment, see how to, you know, what the issues really are, how to address them and apply, and apply the principles, you know, to, in our own systems. Uh, so I, I see things like, you know, somebody's already mentioned, how do we fund this? or there's going to be how do we <clears throat> how do we maintain it because this is a really complex technology we have to build capacity in but we don't have so much expertise and even in europe there's a limited expertise in this area as well so all of that has to be taken into consideration in the design 
uh, of this system moving on. But yes, it's um, interesting times and there are many possibilities and we have good friends. Um, so all we, we will be able to, with, with support of the infrastructure, uh, I want to mean the admin infrastructure, the, 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 prim the primary stakeholders or the institutions, the community itself, because if we can, if we can come up with community driven solutions, then we'll find we would have the most sustainable foundation. Yes, we need the TED funds and the ministries for the policies and for to catalyze the process, but this should be owned um, lock, stock and barrel by the community. Yep. Um, uh, take that on board, um, Omo. Um, are there any more questions, uh, Ahmed, if not? Um, are there any more actually, questions? Actually, there are no any other questions. This is the end of, of it. So uh, maybe I hand over back to you, Owen. Thank you okay. very much, everybody. Right. Okay. Well then, um, I guess, um, first of all, I'd like to say to the attendees, uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, I'd like you all to be able to go back to your institutions as well and uh, really look at joining the Identity Federation. We're much stronger as a community. We have more, uh, more institutions joining the Federation and that gives us access to all kinds of uh, opportunities to improve uh, research and education practice. If uh, people have further questions that they would like uh, us to address, they can, they can actually send messages to, I think, support at eduid.ng. Um, I'll just put that in the chat. Um, if there are any, any questions about uh, next steps they need to take or if they need more, more information about uh, what they need to do uh, concerning uh, identity federations and edugain. So uh, we really want to drive this, we want to exploit the local opportunities and the global opportunities that are available to improve, improve education and practice. So thank you. I'd like to also thank our speakers, um, Mark Williams for chipping in uh, here and there, um, and Alex uh, Stewart from GISC UK, uh, Mario Real from Gion, um, and uh, Ahmed Shafei from Usmanu Danford University for moderating. And thank you, uh, Mahmoud Mohammed and Omar Waya from uh, WACRED. Mahmoud is uh, from Federal Ministry of Education and uh, has the ear of the Honorable Minister. Thank you for attending and for your comments. And thank you everyone else for, for being here. I hope you found it very informative and useful. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all for the sessions that we'll be having tomorrow. The morning session will be kind of an extension of what we talked about this morning, about how do we improve funding for open science. So I'd like you all to join that but I really don't want any of you to miss the afternoon session on spawning open science communities in the afternoon. We've got a lot of very rich speakers who are going to be talking about that. And I'm really looking forward to having a full complement of librarians, researchers, and uh, DICTs participating, particularly in the afternoon session tomorrow. So thank you everyone. Um, we've actually managed to finish within uh, Within time today, and uh, yeah. have a nice uh, afternoon, you. evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good. Take care. Yeah. Goodbye. It was a pleasure.